Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the last three months of the year 2013. And this is a series discussing the sanctuary, all the way from the ancient sanctuary that was produced or made at the bottom of Mount Sinai, down through the final sanctuary that we believe will be established in heaven, and how those might relate it and so forth. Our lesson for this session is for December 14 of 2013. It's lesson number 11 in that series, entitled Our Prophetic Message, and it's a mainly focused on what we call the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. I hope by now you've got your Bible in hand, and you're ready to follow with us as we uh, read several passages, a number of passages in Scripture that will talk about this. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we come recognizing your presence. We know you're always here, but we want to especially recognize it and recognize the presence of your Holy Spirit. May he guide our thoughts and our words as we spend some time together here uh, studying these uh, very significant lessons. May they, uh, the words that are spoken, be uh, an enlightenment to all who listen, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We were looking last time at Daniel 7 and 8, and now we're going to see possible links between Daniel 7 and 8 and the book of Revelation. And I should so throw in a little bit of Daniel 12 at the same time. Um, Revelation 12 to 14 is the center of the book of Revelation and forms a kind of uh, central focus of that book, and that's what we're going to talk. That's what we're going to talk about mainly. In chapter 14, there are those three angels' messages. Um, so, in the book of Daniel, especially Daniel 12, he was told to seal up the book. Let's take just a moment to look at that. It's actually. Um, Daniel 12, and um, it's, I'm sorry here, um, here it is, verse 4, he said to me, O now, Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Meanwhile, many people waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. Sorry for that problem with my computer there. Um, so the book was sealed up, but is that the end of the story? It says it was sealed up until what time? The end. Yes. The end of the world. Hmm. What, what, do we know for sure when that will be? At the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe isn't, soon. Isn't, isn't that a little late? Well, the end, there's two. Th the Bible talks about two different sec two two different references he uses to talk about the end of the world. There's of course the end of time or the end of the world, which would be too late. There's another expression called the time of the end, which means a period of time. We believe it started in the year 1844 up to the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. So if we're talking about the time of the end, that's definitely not too late. That's right now. That would be right now, wouldn't it? Yeah, not only that, look at Revelation 10, verse 8. Revelation 10, verse 8. Then the voice that I had heard speaking from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the open scroll, which is in the hand of the angel, standing on the sea and on the land. I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Now, I took the little scroll from his hand, ate it, and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but after I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then it was told, once again, you must proclaim God's message about many nations, races, languages, and kings. So the first challenging question for you, is it possible that that's the same scroll that Daniel was talking about? Who was the I in that passage? It was, well, it, John. It was John. It would be John. The, John the Revelator? Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. And why would the scroll only be written on one side? Well, that's got to be important. <laughs> yeah, it, 
Houston, maybe. They wouldn't put it in there if it wasn't in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there, be, there are other schools that are written. It, this, the Revelation talks what about, about others. the Seven Thunders? Well, those are, co those are coming up there, but God told John not to write anything about them, so we don't know anything about them. So they're still sealed up. Still sealed up. <laughs> Is well, it's not sealed up because sealed well, up would mean it was written down in a scroll and then sealed. We have no evidence it was ever written down. But it has the same effect. Well, yeah. Is the word in Daniel for scroll the same word as the word in Revelation? They're well, talking about the same thing? Uh, that's a good question. It's a fair question. It's a little hard to say for sure because Daniel is written in Aramaic and Hebrew and Revelation is written in Greek. Ah. But probably. Then there's a scroll that um, was taken from uh, the one sitting on the throne. Yeah. That was written on both sides. Yes. So... I think there's connections there. Well, let's look at what what's a possi some possibilities here. Uh, what, 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 what do we know about that scroll? It's a part of the... There in Revelation 10, what is that? Do we remember? Did the angel, part of the hand, did the angel seven, handle hand seven, John the, the scroll in Revelation? Yeah. yeah. So the angel handed him an open scroll. Mm -hmm. Somebody told him to take it, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the angel open Daniel's closed book and then hand it to John? Well, I mean, that's the question. That's really a question. Are these things related? That's, I mean, that's not essential. We don't, it, it's not, we don't have to know that that's the case, but it looks suspicious. If Daniel says, here's, he, he received the scroll, he, he writes on it, he closes it up, he seals it, and, and God says, seal this, this scroll up until the period of the end of this world's history. Then we come over to Revelation, and here's a scroll that he's talking about the very end events of this, in this world, and here's this scroll, and he swallows it, and it's sweet, and then it's sour, and you know, could it be the same? That's the question. Is Daniel's scroll a literal scroll and laying around someplace? Now? Uh, it, if it was, it was de it's deteriorated by now. That was uh, probably stuffed in a jar or something. Well, 2,500 years ago. <laughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's yeah. Well, no, it's not around because it was eaten. Yeah. It seems to me there's a kind of a yeah. parallel. A lot of Daniel's visions, he knew what was going on. It was in his lifetime, his yeah. life experience, and later on it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Same with John, except John was a little closer to, mm -hmm. to where we are, although far away. Okay. Well, the, the focus of our lesson here today may be something to do with that little scroll. Let's see if we can find a connection to it. But right now, turn to Revelation 14, and I might add, um, if you're interested in looking at the materials that we use, we prepare to, um, to study together here, they're available on our website. It's theox dot org. That stands for Theological Crossroads. And it's, of course, a, a, a tax-free uh, organization. So then I saw, and I'm now turning to Revelation 14. I'm going to read from verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news. So there's the eternal gospel, okay? The eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Is this message intended to go to the whole world? Yes. Absolutely. Sure looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah. The God intends for this message to go to the whole world. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Now, um, we know that in the history of our church, in fact, way back before our church was even started, but even dreamed of, there were people who were studying this message. What do we know about them? What do we know about the history of the interpretation of this passage? Do you remember? Didn't they think God was going to, Jesus was going to come back and start judging uh, people here on this earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were, Not, yeah. You say they were uh, uh, certainly in the uh, 
18th century, mid to late 18th century, they started to see signs and people realized this was, some of this was in the Bible and it even started earlier than that, but that's when it started coming to fruition. Okay, let's, let's, let's build up to that because I want to, I'm going to really focus on what Carrie has just said. Those who have carefully read the book of Revelation will recognize that the whole book really focuses on the ending of this world's history. Every section, there are different sections, a bunch of sevens, as you know, but each one of them moves forward and focuses on what happens at the end. There's a, there's a, a, a sixth, whatever it is, a trumpet or a seal or a plague, and then there's a break and something important is supposed to happen, and then there's a seventh, and usually the seventh is directly connected with the second coming. That's a, sort of just a general pattern. In Revelation 10, we were just looking back to, we see a mighty angel standing with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. Now, what does that imply to you? Big. He's a big guy, right? This is not someone who just happens to be standing at the edge of the water. This should remind us of the angel in Daniel 8, where he saw angels on both sides of a river in that case. If you happen to be familiar with the writings of Ellen White, there's a very significant passage about this in the book of Maranatha, chapter, uh, well, page 18, verses 1 and, I mean, paragraphs 1 and 2. And compare this with Daniel 12, 1 and 7. The angel wearing the linen clothes said, At that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation, whose names are written in God's book, will be saved. Now, Many of you know that William Miller and others, well, I, actually, I shouldn't start with William Miller. Um, Isaac Newton, the famous scientist, 50 years before William Miller, wrote a book about, uh, the book about Daniel and Revelation, about prophecies leading up to the end of the world. And um, he, he predicted much of what was, was the founding of the Adventist Church right there. Yes. But William Miller started studying this. He says, this sounds like Jesus must be coming again. This is up to the end, right? Well, look at verse 7. The angel raised both hands toward the sky and made a solemn promise in the name of the eternal God. That's what the angel does in Revelation. Same thing. I heard him say it will be three and a half years. When the persecution of God's people ends, all these things will have happened. Okay? So there was supposed to be a time of what first? Persecution of God's people. Okay? And then what's going to happen? Some, some final events are going to happen, right? Well, let's look at the history, just to, just to see why. It's, it's, it, the interest, history is very interesting. Um, it began in 1755 with the Lisbon earthquake, which had a massive effect not only on Lisbon, but much of Europe, and in North Africa as well. And people was just taking notice. Then in 1776 to 1782, what happened? The rise of the United States. The rise of the United States, a completely new type of government that was founded on a basic principle of the separation of church and state. So religion can be over here, state is over here, the never the two shall meet. Then the dark day occurred in 1780, and then the French Revolution began in, beginning in 1789. They tried to throw religion out completely followed by the rest of the Pope and his death in 1798, and people started saying, hold on a minute, that sounds like a lot of stuff that was predicted in the Bible. And they started studying their Bibles furiously. I mean, serious people, scientists, and great debates were, were held on this subject. And then when the stars fell in 1833, they were sure of it, okay? Well, during that time, guess what happened? People became very interested. Look at the Bible says the gospel is supposed to go to the whole world during this time. They formed Bible societies. They started employing people to translate the Bible into all sorts of different languages. They could send them out. The first missionaries were sent to Africa and southern India and China and so forth. And then um, they said, look, all these things that were predicted in the Bible are, are taking place. Is that at the end of the French Revolution, the French tried to eliminate religion from their country, but that failed. In 1801, 1801 the Bible societies, which had, formed, which had formed in England and elsewhere, began translating and printing Bibles, as we mentioned. So how does all this relate to Revelation 10? Look at Revelation 10, 11. Then I was told, 
Once again, you must proclaim God's message about many nations, races, languages, and kings. So, is there something more still that needs to be done after all this events have happened? It looks like it, doesn't it? There's still to, something to be done. You need to proclaim again. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of is God's method of operation to make sure he's heard, um, not to just give the message once, but to give it mm -hmm. twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Humanity, humanity is kind of hard-headed. Mm -hmm. we, we need to hear many times. Yeah, the official, uh, the official word, this, this study was done a number of years ago. It might be worse now. But advertisers used to say, in order to get you uh, the idea of a new product or something stuck in your head, you need to hear it 20 times. Well, but some of these events are taking, are occurring over kind of long periods of time. So the people that learned at one particular age, they're dead. Yeah. And now there's a new group that comes along that has to learn. Okay, so let's take a, a, a closer look at these uh, verses in Revelation 14 that we think probably has to relate. And why, why do we think they're related to what's in Revelation 10? We just said that what's going to happen at the end of Revelation 10? It's going to every nation, tribe, language, and so forth. Well, look at Revelation 14, 6 again. Then I saw another angel fly high in the heaven. Same thing we were talking about just a moment ago. Well, my... Bible just disappeared. Your computer has a mind of its own. Yeah, it does. Wow. Sorry, give me just a second here and we'll be back here. Well, that angel said to proclaim to all the peoples and that's another worldwide message. Mm -hmm. So, let's go back here just a second. Another worldwide, he said in a loud voice, honor God and praise his greatness for the time, I'm sorry, I need to back up eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Is that, I mean, is this, are there multiple messages that need to be sent to the whole world, or is there one message that's been talked about several times? That would be the question. One message several times. Is the gospel a single message? Yes. Or is it a lot of different messages? Well, there are several points to the oh, there's main different thrust points, of the message. But it's a, it's, a, it's a package. It fits together. It holds together. So this is, you know, this is the gospel. And this, guy, this angel says in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of waters. So if you read one of the more traditional translations, what does it say there? You're supposed to fear God. Are we, uh, what does that mean? It tends to be, I think, an earlier, it's an earlier English expression you don't hear so much mm -hmm. anymore. It ranges from respect to downright, uh, almost fear. <laughs> I mean, there's a range of meaning, meanings mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Love. Well, so what can it, what, what, what could it mean? It will look at some of the passages that might be related to those who are true believers correctly fear God, that is, reverence and respect Him, Revelation 11, 18. A number of translations use the words honor or respect for God in Revelation 14, 7. Revelation 19, 5 suggests that we should praise Him. Revelation 14, 12 tells us his, that His true people will obey His commandments. Revelation 15, 4 suggests we will glorify His name. So would all those things be included in fearing the Lord? So the message at the end of time is to respect, praise, fear God. Honor. Honor yeah. God. Sure. Luke, Luke 2, verse 10 and 11, when the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Mm -hmm. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That's the gospel mm -hmm. right there. It's mm -hmm. a source of joy, not fear. Yeah. But there is a more basic message, meaning of fear, that Carrie has mentioned. That just means to be afraid, be terrorized. Does God want us to be afraid when we hear his end time message? Absolutely not. Well, truthfully, to the unfaithful, a judgment, our message is a message of fear. Right? How would we, how would we, how would we prove that? Is there a scripture that would say that? 
Well, back in Revelation 6, look at this. Then the kings of the earth, the rulers and the military chiefs, this is verse 15 and 16, the rich and the powerful and all other people, slave and free, hid themselves in caves under rocks on the mountains. Why are they hiding themselves? They called out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the eyes of the one who sits on the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. The terrible day of their anger is here and who can stand against it? What does that imply? Their sinning time is up. Their sinning time is up, okay. Yeah, exactly. Judgment time for them. It depends upon how one interprets the word anger and mm -hmm. wrath that we've talked about many times. That, we're going uh, to get to that. Yeah. So would it be correct, let's, let's just talk about this, uh, and let's just let's talk a little bit of shop talk here. When I was young, I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it used to be a standard expression in those days. If you were baptized into the Adventist church, the expression was, you have accepted the third angel's message. We don't use that expression quite so much in our day, now as we did back then. But the implication was what? You accepted what, it was, entail what was entailed in it. The, the implication was the Adventist church had taken upon itself the notion that these three angels' messages were our message to give to the world, right? In the last days. Yeah, that, that was the idea. Is that still our, our, our belief? I think so. Well, when you read the literature, it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we're, you're trying to shirk your duty, or what are you trying to tell us? Well, you were asking me for a, a state of the church, and I gave you part I of the see. state of the church. <laughs> I see, okay. Well, First. if you go to any other church, you never, they never even stop at these passages. They never even, I mean, I studied Revelation with several churches, and I had never even heard of three angels. Mm -hmm. So somehow it's just skipped over. They, they like Armageddon. That's what yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. But would it be correct to call the three angels' messages God's last warning to the world? Yeah. Probably. Good statement. Yeah. Definitely. When do you think these, these messages were really given? When were they first given? Or, or, or when are they supposed to be given? What? I mean, there's three, the angels, yeah. there's three angels giving the yeah. message. Mm -hmm. uh, is it like the pictures where there's three of them coming down into the earth at the okay, same time? Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. Traditionally, Adventists have believed it like this. When they, were, when they got the, the idea from Daniel 8 and 9 that the second coming of Jesus was right upon them, they started looking for other places in the Bible. And they came upon this and they said, look, here it is. It's talking about the time. You know, the hour of his judgment has come. Wasn't that their message? That God's, God's hour of judgment has come. He's going to come here at any moment now. We're going to tell you specifically the exact day. And you better be ready. So they preached that that was their understanding of the first angel's message. Well, that was almost 200 years ago. Almost 200 years ago. I think ago. the three angels are flying. 3ABN, LLBN, <laughs> Hope, followed by several more. And it's lightning the whole world. Okay. But let's go back to, <laughs> let's go back to, you, you, you're good up to. Plug, good <laughs> Okay, let's go back to the history here of the church. What happened to those original people who came out of those other churches and started really believing in the advent, the second advent of Christ? Do you remember? Did they come out or did they get kicked out? Well, they wanted to carry the message back to their churches, and when they tried to do that, they got kicked out. And so then they started reading the second angel's message, which said what? Come out of her, my people. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. And they said, oh, this must be talking about those other churches that are not willing to accept our message about the second advent of Christ. So we need to get out. That's where Babylon is. We need to get out of Babylon. That was the way they understood the second angel's message. And, of course, then there came the great disappointment. And it wasn't until quite a long time later they started looking at the third angel's message and said, well, how does this fit in? And we'll look at that in a moment. I'm not sure we're quite ready for that yet. But how good a motivator is fear? <laughs> Pretty powerful. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good? Anger, how, how anger long? is a bigger 
<laughs> how, how, how long does it last? Fear? Fear. Until you raise it up again. I see. It lasted the children of Israel less than 40 days until they were da dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf. Yep. Exodus 19 and 20. And if you read right through the Bible, I mean, okay, the flood. Now, I mean, that ought to have been, that should have scared everybody spitless, right? Yeah, but they never heard, seen the rain. There was no. So, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about the people afterwards. They should have said, man, a life, look what happens when people got out of line. We'll never sin another day in our lives, right? The interesting thing about this that strikes me is if getting back to Sir Isaac Newton and earlier, a lot of the dates they worked out were very, very close and yep. accurate. And what William Miller and the entourage he had then didn't get pick up on that says very specifically, no man knows the time or the hour of Christ's coming. Now, William Miller picked that up and he was really, that's why he didn't preach for a long time. He said, how can, it seems like we're predicting a precise date here, but how can this, it says nobody knows the hour, so how can I preach this back and but forth? a lot of people didn't. And no, a lot of people don't. didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we just talked about Mount Sinai. Um, he doesn't want us to be afraid of him, but let's be honest, back in the days of the Israelites, virtually every god, and remember in those days there was a god, different god for every nation, and some of the nations had a lot of different gods. And basically you had to, you either uh, uh, tried to appear, uh, either, either tried to be nice to the good god so that he would bless you, and, or you tried to appease the bad god so he wouldn't curse you, and they didn't, they weren't quite sure how to deal with a God who wasn't angry at them, that wasn't, didn't need now, to be appeased. How did they determine when they carved this piece of stone or wood that this God was good or this God was something to be feared? I mean, was that them putting their yeah. own thoughts into this piece of marble or? Absolutely. Because it surely didn't talk to them and say, yeah. hey, I'm a good God, or I, uh, you need to uh, sacrifice your babies to me. Yeah. Some of it was mythology that was handed down. Thank you. Yeah. Straight ignorance. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's, let's go to the New Testament now. How do we deal with some passages? Look at Hebrews 12, 29. How do we deal with that? Because our God is indeed a destroying fire. That ought to make you want him, love him, right? Is that translated correctly? It is. You can call it a consuming fire if you want, but that didn't change the picture very much. And what is meant by fire? Well, that's the question. What is, it, what is meant by fire? And how many times in the Bible has God's presence been connected to fire? Quite a few. Lots. Back in, Reve back in Exodus, we have him coming down on the mountain. It looks like what? Fire. Looked like fire. Exodus well, 24. The burning bush. The burning bush. Elvis Presley even had a song, I'm a hunk of hunk of burning love. Yeah, there you go. So. Well, you go over. <laughs> <laughs> you go over well, to. it's burning. <laughs> yeah, you go over to uh, Ezekiel 1 and 2, and there's God again, and, and, and Daniel. Fire. There's fire. In, in Ezekiel, there's sure. fire. I mean. Legs, mm, Legs pillars of fire. Yeah. Exactly. Also fire, it looked like fire from the eyes. So why would God want to picture himself like that? Well, you know, there is another thing that's happening here. We, yeah. we do look at fire differently nowadays than we did back then. Yes. Because back then, fire was just a source of light. Mm -hmm. And it didn't well, necessarily not, not just mean light, also that it heat. burns you. It, it could mean that, I mean, if you saw a person out in the middle of a dark field and he was glowing back then what would they say he's on fire. he's yeah he's on fire he wouldn't say well he glows like a light bulb he wouldn't say that they don't know what that means mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it, you know you got to look at look at it that way too it isn't yeah, just yeah. that it's a dangerous burning well, thing that you'll well, damage yourself with also the uh sanctuary had the god uh he was a fire by night uh, or mm -hmm. something. Uh, a cloud by day to, to, to protect them from the heat and a fire by night and to give them light. a fire by night. And so mm -hmm. the Israelites knew God is a fire and not a consuming fire, yeah. but a protecting fire. Yeah. Well, what about Hebrews 10? This is, this is the, you know, the, the book in the Old Testament that's supposed to help us understand all about the sanctuary, right? Look at Hebrews 10, verse 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Does that remind you of any famous sermons you might have heard of? Mm -hmm. Anybody remember any names? Jonathan Edwards is. Jonathan Edwards. Uh, gets that reputation. And what was the name of his sermon? Do you remember? Sinners in the hands of an angry Sinners God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he had pictures of them dangling over. Uh, held up by a spider springs. web and uh, dangling over the fire, roasting, I guess, or barbecuing or whatever it was. Yeah, an angry like God, that's the way it would be. Is yeah. that a good translation? A terrifying yeah. thing? It is terrifying to fall into the hands of the yeah. God? I thought the people at the end of the earth, or end of time, were running and saying, this is my God, and here he is. And well, some are. If you go back to Isaiah, there's ones that say, this is my God, I've waited, I waited for him and he will save me. But there are others that are running and crawling for the rocks and mountains to fall on us. And what's the difference? There, there is some things in the yeah. Bible where people have come up to angels and they were terrified to death. Mm -hmm. And the angels told them not to be afraid. So Even there might God. be just something about something non-human that looks bigger and more powerful than us might give us fear anyway that we have to get used to. I mean, there's, there might be something over there. We do have a tendency to be afraid of the unknown. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think people that want to be buried, and there's a lot of people in, in our world that poo-poo God, but when the push comes to shove and it's face to face, they realize what's going on and they know that that's what they deserve. You remember a few lessons back, Stephen yeah. Hawking's quote, he said, a belief in the afterlife is just for people who are afraid of the dark. dark. That's right. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. There's an old saying in, about <coughs> fearing God. You know, in, in war, there are no, uh, no atheists in the foxholes. Fox yeah. There's, yeah. There's a fear. Well, let's, 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 we're, we're taking a broad look at these passages, these, the, the three angels' messages, and let's look a little bit at the context. We've already read 14, 17. Look at, jump over it to the end of it and look at chapter 14, starting with verse 14. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was what looked like a human being with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. What does that sound like? Time for the harvest. Yeah. <clears throat> then another angel came out from the temple and cried out in a loud voice as one who was sitting on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap the harvest. Because the time has come, the earth is ripe for the harvest. Now that would be a metaphor for what? The end of the world. And who's coming? Jesus coming. Well, the Jesus. second coming of Jesus, right? Yeah. Then we read on. Then the one, um, then the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle on the earth, and the earth's harvest was reaped. Then I saw another angel come out of the temple in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar. He shouted in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, use your sickle and cut the grapes from the vineyard of the earth because the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung a sickle on the earth, cut the grapes from the vine, and threw them into the winepress of God's furious anger. The grapes were squeezed out in the winepress outside the city. The blood came out of the winepress in a flood 300 kilometers long and nearly two meters deep. Wow. Now are you saying that Jesus came out and did the sickle and a harvest to good people and this angel came out and with another sickle and harvest uh, the ones that were going to be thrown into the wine press? That's a possibility. I don't know that you could prove that absolutely, but that's a possibility, yes. At least both of these are metaphors for the final judgment. Okay. Okay. Okay, well one implication is this. If you're, if you're going through in sequence here, and we have a judgment in Revelation 14, 7, and then later you have a couple of metaphors for the second coming. The judgment must be before the second coming, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be implied? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things in Revelation that doesn't necessarily be in sequence. Though. Yeah, but within each in the grouping, it seems to be in sequence, right? Okay, I guess you can yeah. that rule if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so now we're going to try to see if we can fit it with other things. We talked about the Great Religious Awakening. Were there any biblical prophecies that might help us to nail down the timing here? There's two of them, aren't there? There's a time of persecution we read about in Daniel, and it says it's going to come at the end of a period of three and a half years or 
42 months or 1260 days, right? Mm -hmm. And without going into all the technical details, we talked about those a few weeks ago, that period of time went from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., at which time the Pope was arrested, put in prison, and shortly thereafter died. And everybody thought, okay, the Catholic Church is finished. That was the, that was the thought. I mean, look, the Pope is dead. See? Well, so what about that? Is, is, is that a clue? Does that help us? This judgment presumably would come somewhere after that? Well, how do we know? How would we, how would we decide? Well, when the prophecy ended, that was supposed to be the beginning of the time of the end. And mm -hmm. so, um, and then when Jesus comes, he has his reward with him. So somehow the judgment is between the time of the end and when Jesus comes, and that is where we are now Living. In the time of the end. Yeah. Well, it does mention here, very interestingly, not just in Daniel, there's several references to the three th time, times, and half a time, or the three and a half years. Look at this. In Revelation 12, verse 6, the woman fled to the desert to a place where God had prepared for her, where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. That's the same period of time, right? And if you go down a little bit later, it talks about it again. So, uh, and, and that we said that one ended in 1798. There was another prophecy in Daniel 8, 14. What do we know about that one? Well, that was what we studied last time. Remember, it started with, from the decree that went forth for, to, for the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem, right? Not the temple, but the, the city. And that happened with Ezra, who returned with a group of people in the year 457 B.C., and how many days was it supposed to go on, or day years? 2300. 2300. And we saw how, if you follow that through, that takes us down to the year 1844. So here we can see that here's a couple of time prophecies, and a lot of events that seem to match biblical prophecies, and so forth, and they're all sort of coming together. And, you know, if you think about it, from 1755 to 1844, that's a period of less than 100 years. And here, every few years, there's something happens that says, we're in the time of the what? The time of the end, right? Look like. Well. Or we're ending the prophecies and then you're going to be in the time of the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because that's going to come right after it, right? Well, let's go back to Revelation 14. See what, what follows. We've talked about the first angel's message somewhat. What was the second angel's message? Evelyn has fallen. A second angel followed the first, this is Revelation 14, 8, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all people drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Bang, it's done. Then you're to the third angels. So we don't know much about that angel until we go over to where? We don't have time to go there now, but you go over to Revelation 18, and it gives us a lot more details of this second angel's message. But then we go to the third angel's message, which we want to focus a little bit more on right now. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who has the mark of its name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Wow. What do we do with all those words? I don't Anger. recall hearing that message very much. It's not being preached very much anymore? <clears throat> I just don't recall hearing much about it. I see. Anger, wrath, torment, forever and ever. <laughs> well, uh, it's fair to say that this language, what I just read to you, is the fiercest language, the most severe language in the entire Bible. And here it is at the end, and God, I mean, this is the same author that wrote in, in, in those, one of those little books, 1 John 4, 8 and 16, God is love. So why is he talking like this? 
this is a, a warning call. This is, this is love, mm -hmm. in a sense, um, trying to get us to follow the Lord. Well, Genesis two seven was a or seventeen was a warning too, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was it was no, wasn't a threat, mm -hmm. wasn't a uh, no explanation of how you're going to die. So, if you sin, you will die. Yeah. Yeah. If your kid is running and there's a hole coming and you know it and the kid doesn't, you're going to scream your head off. Mm -hmm. You're not going to uh, play this loving whatever. You're going to scream. And so I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't say quietly. Johnny, I don't, I don't think you should go over there. Yeah. So this is God's, about his last message. Mm -hmm. And so is he screaming at the world now? And I, don't, the, I don't hear any, any mysterious voice from the earth, say, from the heavens, here saying this. Who's, who is supposed to be giving this message? Well, that angel guy, he's supposed to be running around doing No, that's not the way I read scripture. <laughs> the message has been given to whom? Us. So we go down the road yelling what the scripture says. We get well, signs what is that going to do? Down the you? streets? What are we. Oh, what is that going to do for you? <laughs> I mean, you've got to understand what it means first. Yeah. If this is the end time here, and this is, you it, know. Maybe the reason it's not being heard is because we, don't, we haven't figured it out. Well, that be, could be. be careful. God loves us. He's coming back soon. Uh, don't don't follow those who do not worship the Lord. It gets your attention, if nothing else. Fear is, I mean, I'll tell you, the one thing that fear clearly accomplishes in the Bible is grabbing people's attention. Right. That's what it does. It doesn't last long, but it grabs the attention. I, I have a, a teenager and he's a wonderful son, mm -hmm. fabulous son, almost all straight A's, mm -hmm. but I constantly have to threaten him about removing all the gadgets. Mm -hmm. If you get a bad grade, that means you were on the gadgets too much. Mm -hmm. Oh no, Dad, you don't understand. It's hard, it's hard. Well, if you weren't on the gadgets, you would have gotten the better grade. Isn't yeah. that true? And he admits yeah. it. So he knows. So how do you make the transition from the angel is supposed to be preaching here to the humans are supposed to be preaching? How do we, well, here, how that's, do we a good, that? that's a very good question. I always um, ask good questions. So. That's, I'm happy <laughs> to hear that. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, who is supposed to be giving this, these messages at the end of the world? I mean, I mean let's, let's be honest. Let's just be really blunt. If God, why doesn't God just send a bunch of angels down here? They could say it better, they understand God better, and let them do the job. Well, it's our job. Well, the word, the word angel. Hold on now. <laughs> you're, you're switching horses in the middle of the stream here. <laughs> if we look at this from, from uh, first century, <coughs> toward the end of the first century, what is, how is he going to explain uh, this is going to happen? So he says, uh, and the word angel means a messenger, mm -hmm. and it's, it is a message. And it had to go to the whole world. And in his mind, how's he going to explain that? Well, today we could say, well, you've got satellites, you've got uh, uh, other electronic transmission methods, and uh, that that message can be going through. It's go through through the mid heavens. Wasn't it Jesus's command? Yes. It was mm -hmm. Jesus' yes. command yes. that we're supposed to do that. Go ye Great therefore and. Yeah, the Great Commission, commission Matthew Sight. 28, 19 and 20, right there. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached all the world. The, world. the yeah. angels are just giving us a hint as to what. But there's a reason for that. We're supposed to study our Bibles. We're supposed to pray for God's guidance, and then we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to witness. Why does God ask us to do that? When we have to explain something, as in witnessing, we learn it better ourselves, yeah. Yeah. Have you or ever we can't that? witness. <laughs> To quote you, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the point is, I mean, I sit here in front, and, and, and I, I mean, when I come to these things, you people are always, you know, looking at me and like, I'm supposed, <laughs> like I'm supposed to have the answers here. And boy, I tell you, you I have to struggle with these things. Well, how, what's going to happen when those questions come? If you have to try to be prepared to give the answers, you, you, better, be, you better be studying it. The, the answer to that, a, it's a... That's a, a very big answer to that, to that question. It's more than it's just good for us. And yeah. I think somehow, uh, it just somehow really it's, it's part of our relationship to God. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, 
it's the, 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 we're tied with him, and that's what we do. I, d I just think it won't work unless it's done that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just simple. I mean, there's. Uh, it, you, if you had angels go out and do it, um, what is that going to do? <coughs> well, they might do a good job, but the rest of us be sitting back sleeping. No, I don't think they would do a good job. I don't think they could do a good job. We've got to do it because. We're the ones that communicate to them. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have to communicate. Well, yeah. look, look at a Revelation 11, verses 17 and 18. Does this sound like anything that should be going on in our world today, or maybe is? Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, that's of course talking about the eternal God, we thank you that you have taken your great power and have begun to rule. The heathen were filled with rage because the time for your anger has come, the time for the dead to be judged. The time has come to reward your saints, the prophets, and all your people, all who have reverence for you. That's that fearing God thing. Great and small alike, the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Is anything like that happening in our day? You mean are we destroying the earth? Come on now, how could that be? <laughs> well, that's a pretty broad statement. I mean, mm -hmm. you only got to, not, it's not just looking after the earth per se, look what's yeah. happening in Africa. They're killing Christians, they're killing yeah. each other. Well, not just in All Africa. of that, is, uh, I know, but everywhere you look, there is mm -hmm. destruction on the earth, in the earth. So I think it has a broad meaning there. Yeah. Is this now turned into an ecology thing? That it looks like earth? that's part of it. Well, I don't know, I think earth might, might be pointing to something here that May not be just ecology. What's the word? What's the word that is translated as Earth? Is it earth, mean Earth or the stories of the Earth? I mean, that could now be the people. Hold on just a second. I will answer that question for you. We could do that here with this fancy computer program we've got here. Um, the end of the end of verse seven, verse eighteen. Yep. 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 Well, God right is there. creation. God was the original ecologist, or whatever. Earth, gay. Yeah, it's the, the usual standard word for Earth. It could be and, quite and inclusive, though, could it? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it yeah. Does, this is not just cosmos. This is not just the cosmos. The people who live on this earth. This is talking about the ball of mud, the everything involved. Of course, the other thing is that it says those who destroy the earth. Now, mm -hmm. who's those? It may not just be humanity. Who else would it be? Satan's angels. Well, there's I the mean, judgment time coming it, for them they, too. They use yes. they use finite human beings to accomplish their ends. Yeah, it could be more than that. If well, it's, not, it's, it's not the animals, I mean, who else but the humans? Satan and yeah. his angels. Well, the judgment has got to take place at a time when the gates of mercy are still open. God is not going to carry on with the judgment at a time when it's too late for us to respond. I think everybody would agree with that, right? Uh, I'm not too sure. You think God is going to wait and send the message of the gospel after the probation is closed? Well, we're talking about the judgment here. I thought that was when the judgment comes. You have a second chance here to. Okay, my implication was at the end of the judgment. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe okay. that wasn't right. clear. Look, look at Revelation 19:2. True and just are his judgments. He has condemned the prostitute who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. God has punished her because she, was, she killed his servants. And in Revelation, when we talk about women, what is it talking about? The church. The church. Is, are they talking about the prostitute that's riding the beast there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is God's wrath always reactive? Hmm. Or does he sometimes just strike out on his own and zap some people? No. By reactive, <laughs> do you mean... It does God, is he, God's anger he, uh, as a result of something that exactly, others do? Exactly. Sure. So he has these little temper tantrums? No. But you said always. I don't think he is always reactive. Well, look at Hosea 4.17. Does this give us a clue? The people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. Does that have something to do with God's wrath? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, they were doing something and they didn't want to correct, so God just said, uh, let them continue doing what they want to do. We don't have time to go into an in-depth study of the book of Revelation, but if you look at the end of Revelation 16 and the end of Revelation 17, you discover that uh, there's pretty strong evidence there 
that it's the devil and the people who are cooperating with him who are destroying the earth. Yes. So and and God responds to those. And what's God's? How are judge? How do God's judgments work out? Look at Revelation twenty two eleven. Isn't that what Gary said then? He said mm -hmm. Satan and his demons are doing it. Well, that's part of it. Let's let. let but God is involved too. Here's here's God's verdict: Whoever is evil must go on doing evil. Whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whoever is good must go on doing good. Now that's not the devil. And whoever is holy must go on being holy. That's not the devil. He doesn't want anybody to go on being good and holy. So he's not the, the devil's not the only one involved here. Okay? Well, um, God has always said from way back, and it, we're running out of time here. You can read about it in Revelation 17, 15 to 18. God has always said that if the devil were left in charge, you know, he would destroy everything. And look at Revelation 17. We'll look at one verse here and see what this implies. For God has placed it in their hearts, and it's talking about the devil and his side. God has placed it in their hearts the will to carry out his purpose. Whose purpose? God's purpose. By acting together and giving the beast their power to rule until God's words come true. In other words, God says at the end, he's going to let the devil have his, his opportunity to run things the way he wants to do them to do. And what are they going to do? What's the devil going to do? He's going to prove that God was right back in the beginning. He's going to say, the devil is going to be so angry, he's not going to worry about the consequences. He's going to just zap and he's going to do everything. And God says, didn't I tell you? That's the kind of person he is. So is the title of our lesson is our prophetic message. Is that, is that our prophetic message? Well, I would say our prophetic message has to be all of the three angels' messages. We're working our way through them now. Um, and where does the Ten Commandments come in? To all of that. Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12 say that these people who live at the end of this earth's history are supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. That's how you fear and respect God, is you keep his, um, his uh, request, his requirement, or he puts it, he allow God to put it inside you to obey him. But look at these couple of passages from Ellen White. The final contrast, contest, I'm sorry, will be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Prophets and Kings, page 188, paragraph 1. Then here's one that I, I really like. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his character, and it is a standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all, that would be, what are we talking about now? What's the infinite standard? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. Okay? And he talks about the life of Christ as an example. Then he says this. Then the, she says, Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Christ's Obvious is page 315. In other words, the people who keep the commandments because they really believe it's the right thing to do, are the ones who are going to be safe for God to admit to his kingdom. Okay? It's generally, too, that people, uh, Christians, most Christians, if you just ask them if they're knowledgeable, they'll say, oh yeah, we, we believe in the Ten Commandments. We believe people shouldn't kill each other, they shouldn't commit adultery, they should honor their parents, they shouldn't lie or steal or be too covetous, not be too covetous. <laughs> we shouldn't worship other gods and so forth. But there's one commandment they have a problem with. And which one is it? Uh, the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment. Is that an integral part of the Ten Commandments or not? I believe that it is. It's, it seems to be, uh, on a word count, the longest commandment. Mm -hmm. The only commandment that starts out with remember. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Revelation 14, verse 12, mm -hmm. obey God's commandments and and. Revelation 14, verse 7, halfway through, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's very reminiscent of the fourth commandment. Yeah, exactly. Well, then is Sabbath a sort of kind of arbitrary test of our obedience? 
Or is it a sign of loyalty to the one who created us, redeemed us, and plans to spend an eternity of Sabbath fellowshipping with us in the earth made new? And that's Isaiah 66, 23. Do we take the Sabbath seriously enough? And the second angel's message, we are told we must come out of Babylon. In the scriptures, Babylon stands for rebellion against God. Genesis 11, Jeremiah 50 and 51. In the times of the New Testament, Babylon became a code word among Christians for? Rome. Rome. 1 Peter 5, 13. When talking about the end of time, the book of Revelation uses the term Babylon to describe an alliance of apostate churches that are cooperating with cor corrupt political powers. Do we see anything like that going on in our day? What, what do these three angel messages tell us about God? Well, that's a good question. It, it, it tells us that he set up in the beginning a, a, a reasonable standard. Virtually everyone agrees that the Ten Commandments are a good, solid basis for righteousness and truth and worship truth. We had some questions about the Sabbath commandment, but generally we think that's a great idea. God tells us we, we must separate ourselves from sin. We must be honor Him. We must glorify His name and so forth. We want to be ready for the end. And then, we haven't had a time to look at this, but in Revelation 13, at the end, the devil comes out and he says, so help me, I'm going to kill anyone who doesn't have the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 15 to 17. And what's God's response? This is the third angel's message. He says, let me tell you something, anyone who does receive the mark of the beast will not lose just this life, but he will lose eternal life. Now, which is more important? Eternal, eternal life. life. So, are we prepared to say, okay, God, we, we believe we should do it your way. So in this por portion of the book of Revelation, we see a going back and forth. We see the, the Satan side pictured, then we see God's side pictured. And especially in chapters 12 through 14, there is a huge battle, a great controversy, a cosmic conflict, and God ends up winning. Do we want to be on the good side? side? Do we want to be on God's side? Do we accept the everlasting gospel? And do we know how to understand, how to explain to people those three angels' messages? Paul certainly thought he understood the gospel. Revela I mean, sorry, Galatians 1, 8, and 9. He says, anyone who doesn't may be condemned to hell. So what about us? Can we explain the gospel? Can we explain the gospel in terms of the three angels' messages? That is the challenge that has been given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church until the end of time. Will you be a part of it?